What makes something a mental disorder as opposed to just a difference or identity? Stay tuned. As humans, we have a remarkable repertoire of behaviors with a surprising amount of variability in thoughts, beliefs, and interests. Some people are really extroverted with a strong desire to be around others, while others are introverted and prefer one-on-one -on -one interactions with close friends. Some like to go skydiving while others repair antique radios. Some people dance while others definitely don't dance. Maybe that's for the best. Given the diversity of people on this planet, how do we decide which sets of behaviors should be categorized as disorders and which behaviors are just expected variations that make our world great? The answer is, it's not clear cut. It is a messy business indeed. To find the answer, we turn to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the book that clinicians use to categorize and diagnose mental disorders. In their definition of disorders, they begin by acknowledging some limitations. They say, although this manual provides a classification of mental disorders, it must be admitted that no definition adequately specifies precise boundaries for the concept of a mental disorder. The concept of mental disorder, like many other concepts in medicine and science, lacks a consistent operational definition that covers all situations. Of course, then they have to actually try and define it. Here are the criteria that they came up with. Keep in mind, this is the best definition that experts could come up with over decades of revision and thought, and spoiler alert, it's not perfect. First, a mental disorder is characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, and developmental processes underlying mental functioning. The key words there are clinically significant disturbance and dysfunction. Second, mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress or disability in social, occupational, or other important activities. They go on to specify that an expectable or culturally approved response to a common stressor or loss, such as the death of a loved one, is not a mental disorder. Socially deviant behavior, like political, religious, or sexual deviancy, and conflicts that are primarily between the individual and society are also not mental disorders, unless the deviance or conflict results from a dysfunction in the individual. So this definition does some things right. It captures the idea that some people have differences in mental function and that those problems cause significant stress or life problems. It also acknowledges that the cultural context matters. As an extreme example, in some cultures, it would be highly unusual to eat your relatives when they die. But in other cultures, that is considered a way to honor them. A cultural practice isn't a mental disorder, nor is a non-normative behavior that's not the result of a dysfunction, even if it causes significant life problems, such as going on a hunger strike or civil disobedience that leads to arrest or incarceration. So this helps us distinguish between normal differences that we observe in the human rainbow from disorders. For example, some people are very narcissistic. It doesn't become narcissistic personality disorder until it substantially impacts their social or emotional lives, causes them distress, interferes with their job, or things like that. Likewise, people who have anxiety as a result of anxiety-causing situations may not have a disorder, even though they have anxiety. If the anxiety persists in the absence of that situation, however, then it might qualify as a disorder. This definition has some surprising implications, though, and critics say the definition is too broad. First, the wording dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning is really unclear. It leads to some surprising things that the DSM considers disorders that may not be mental in nature, but rather have a biological cause that affects mental functioning. For example, Down syndrome is a genetic disorder which doesn't seem to fit the definition above, but the DSM considers it an intellectual disability. It also includes sleep apnea, which is related to airway obstruction during sleep. 
Now, it does cause stress and cognitive changes, but the cause isn't due to mental dysfunction. It also doesn't distinguish well between temporary states, such as alcohol intoxication or fever delirium, from chronic or long-term conditions. You may behave in maladaptive ways while you're drunk, but surely that shouldn't be considered a temporary mental disorder. So what is the take-home message here? Defining mental disorders is tricky business. Sometimes unpleasant emotional states are expected to occur. There are behaviors that might seem normal in some cultures, but abnormal in others. However, if an individual has disruptions that affect their day-to-day quality of life, social relationships, or ability to care for themselves, then that is likely to qualify as a mental disorder. If you found this video helpful, leave a like, consider subscribing to stay up to date with all things psychology, and until next time, keep thinking.